Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I just want to finish off this section on carboxylic acid derivatives. Uh, so this is the last of this chapter, and then uh, I won't be doing any more of these for a little while. I just wanted to finish this chapter off for a complete list. Uh, no expectations. So let's take a look now. This last section on this chapter is the structure determination of carboxylic acids and carboxylic acid derivatives. Uh, right here, this is pretty informal. For the most part, we use IR and NMR to look at the structures to, to make sure that we have the carboxylic acid or carboxylic acid derivative uh, that we think we do. So the carbonyl is prominent, and as you can see here, the carbonyl comes somewhere between about 1820 all the way down to 1600, and where uh, the frequency at which that carbonyl stretch occurs is dependent on the functionality, whether it's carboxylic acid or an ester or whatnot. Uh, you don't really have to know these exactly. Uh, you can look at these charts when you're doing these problems. You'll have uh, some IR charts, but we can see that uh, the carboxylic acids appear pretty close to where aldehydes and ketones do. There's a little bit of difference. Uh, for the most part, amides are down here. Uh, acid chlorides appear a little bit higher frequencies as well as esters. So let's take a look uh, at what they look like. So here's an IR spec spectrum of propionic acid and it's in the gas phase. So we see our carbonyl peak right here. It's at 1785, it's fairly sharp. We see some stretching here, just below 3000, that's these CH groups that are stretching. And we see a sharp peak here, uh, way out probably, uh, let's take a look, about 3600, yeah. So this is the OH stretch, and, and because it's in the gas phase, it's very sharp. What happens with carboxylic acids is that they're very good uh, hydrogen bond acceptors and donors. And as soon as we get into the liquid phase, we see that uh, things start to, that OH stretch looks much diminished. And that's because most of the carboxylic acids will exist as a dimer in a dilute solution of carbon tetrachloride. And we start seeing these broad uh, range of frequencies because there's different bond strengths and they're all tied together and it gets a little bit uh, less defined, if you'll say. We still have our carbonyl stretch about the same place. It's nice and sharp. Uh, don't worry too much about uh, some of this other information. For the most part in IR, we're looking in about this region and we are also looking down here to see if we have aliphatic, that is CH stretches, that is, uh, hydrogens bonded to sp3 hybridized carbon in around here for hydrogens bonded to sp2 and sp hybridized carbon and then out here for oh stretches nh stretches and different things so but because of this dimerization in solution we get this broad band for the dimer and it kind of dominates over everything we still can see our ch stretches peaking out here and then we have some other features that start to appear and we're not going to worry about those the important thing is we see this, and we also see this broad thing that's very indicative of a carboxylic acid. When we get down to a liquid film, now we see this great big broad stretch that's just dominating everything out past about 2500. Again, very indicative of something like a carboxylic acid. This is very indicative of OH stretches in general. Even if you did liquid films of alcohols, you see these broad absorptions. And in the liquid film, our carbonyl stretch is still there at about 1715 now, but uh, it's getting broader. And that's just because it's a liquid film. Esters, on the other hand, we don't have to worry about all this mess down here because we no longer have the OH uh, in our molecule. Uh, so we see our CH stretching and we see a nice sharp carbonyl peak. 
This is a CO stretch. Oftentimes we can identify it, but again, I don't worry too, too much about those for now. You can worry about those in, in other classes. When we get into primary amides, so here we see a primary amide. We just have an NH2 bonded to our carbonyl carbon. We see two stretches here because our NH2, I don't know if you can see me. I'm going to get over here in the middle. OK, these are my CH bonds here and they could be uh, stretching like this. OK, or they could be stretching symmetrically like this. That's why we see two. There's two different modes of NH. I sorry, I said CH and then NH uh, stretching frequencies, and we see both of those uh, down there. And they are broad because there's a broad range of bond strengths uh, because of hydrogen bonding. Uh, again, we see our CH stretching, uh, nothing but aliphatic ones here, so we expect them all to be below 3,000. There is some other information in here, and again, we're not going to worry too much about that other information. Tertiate amides, so now we no longer have any NH bonds. Those kind of disappear. You do have to be a little careful. You often see small absorptions in, in, in just about everything. Oftentimes there may be some water in your solvent, so you see a little bit of activity down here. So don't overinterpret anything down here uh, unless you're really sure about the conditions. OK, so here we no longer have the NH. Uh, we still have our amide. Notice it's below 1700 because it's in the amide stretch, and we do have our CH stretching as well. And hydrides, just like the NH2, we now have two of these, and they can be stretching asymmetrically, or they can be stretching symmetrically. I won't go through that uh, little demonstration again, but it's the same thing. And we see both of those. Uh, modes of CO vibrations in the IR spectrum. Again, we won't overinterpret things down here, uh, but we do have further information. And if you get more and more comfortable with IR, uh, you can start figuring those things out, but it's not needed at this level. Acyl chlorides, uh, again, we don't have any OHs, so we often don't have anything. We do often see something here called an overtone. I don't want you to worry too much about these overtone bands. Uh, it's more than we need to know right now, but we see our carbonyl stretch, and again, we look to see if we have the right kinds of CH stretching, and all of these are bonded to sp3 hybridized carbon, so they should all appear below about 3,000. Next, we're going to take a look at NMR. Now, NMRs are very distinct for some of our carboxylic acid derivatives. So here we have an ester, and this is a nice ester to look at because we can use a combination of the splitting and the chemical shift uh, to figure things out here. Now, this is a methyl group bonded to the oxygen. We expect that to be a singlet. And if we look at our signal, we only, our spectrum, we only have three signals. We have one here. It integrates, uh, as it turns out, for three. And it is a singlet, so we can very easily uh, assign it to this methyl group. Now you'll notice that this comes very close to four in the proton NMR. That's important uh, because it's bonded directly to the oxygen. It has this really not only electron withdrawing oxygen, but the carbonyl group is electron withdrawing, so it really pushes this uh, absorption down field. I'm sorry, up field. Uh, so we see that around four. Now, here we have an ethyl group, so we expect this thing to be a quartet, and we expect this thing to be a triplet, and if we expand these, that's what these are over here. These are just expansions. We see our triplet. Our triplet is down here. Our triplet is due to the protons on A. Everything is as we would expect. We expect this to be the furthest over here, okay? And, uh, we expect it to be a triplet. That is a triplet. This one we expect to be a little bit to the left, and it is a quartet. When we do the expansion, we clearly see a quartet. Now I'm going to take a look. We're going to have all of the same features here. We're going to have a triplet, a quartet, and a singlet, but it's going to be for different reasons now. And in fact, I have two spectra to compare here. So now remember here, 
we have the ethyl group bonded to the carbonyl carbon and a methyl group bonded to the oxygen. What's different is we now have an ethyl group bonded to the oxygen and a CH3 group bonded to the carbonyl carbon. So we expect B to be a singlet and we look at our singlet, our singlet comes at two. Remember previously when it was bonded, when the methyl group was bonded to the oxygen, it came way out here. We see a signal way out there and it's a quartet. So we can give that an assignment as well. Uh, it's the CH2 group. Okay, we expect it to be a quartet because it's splitting with these three protons. The N plus one rule tells us that will be a quartet. And because it's bonded to the oxygen, we expect it to be down here somewhere and we see it just past four. And our CH3, which is gonna be a triplet, we we find it way down here by one. Now, this is something to always remember. If you think you have an isolated ethyl group, you're gonna see a triplet in a quartet somewhere, okay? Because these two, uh, the protons on these two carbons interact with each other and they give us the triplet quartet pattern. So whenever we have an ethyl group, we look for our triplet, which is the CH3, and our quartet, which is the CH2. And this makes a lot of sense because our quartet is way down here at four, okay? Now, notice here we have an isolated methyl group and an isolated ethyl group, but now we just have a regular ketone. We still expect to see a triplet and a quartet, and we expect to see a singlet, but now we expect the chemical shifts to be slightly different. There is no ester oxygen on this, so we don't expect anything way down at four. And we look, we see our spectrum uh, stops here at just about 2.5. We see a quartet and we see a triplet, so we can assign those. That triplet is this CH3 because it's getting coupled by these two protons. We expect it to be the furthest over here to the right, and that's what we see. We expect this to be a quartet because it's coupling with these three hydrogens. Our N plus one rule tells us that we have three plus one is four. We should see a quartet. That's right here. And it's around two because it's bonded to the carbonyl carbon. And finally, this CH3 group is a singlet and it's coming just past two, is, which is where we expect it because it's bonded to a carbonyl carbon. Uh, so we see that we have those features. We have a triplet and a quartet and a singlet in this spectrum, this spectrum, and the previous spectrum. But we can assign all of those based on both the splitting patterns and the chemical shifts where they appear in the spectrum. So here's a problem, ethyl, uh, ethyl butanol 8 assign the signals. So what we can do right away, we see that ethyl group, we expect a triplet and a quartet, okay? Uh, but when we look over here, I'm just going to expand it for a second, we have a couple of quartets and a couple of, we have one, two, three triplets. We have a quartet over here. And when we have a big mess over here, so let's take a look at what's going on here. So we expect this to be a triplet. We can't really assign it just yet. We'll hold on. This we expect to be a quartet and we expect it because it's bonded to the oxygen. We expect it to be very far downfield. And when we do the expansion, we see right there, we see our quartet around four, exactly as we expect with a this one. So we're going to call this I'm going to use green. I'm going to just call it A and I'm going to assign this one A. You can do your assignments like this. This is one way because clearly you're telling me that these protons appear here on the spectrum. OK, so the next one I want to look at is what am I going to expect for this? This one, I'm going to expect it to be somewhere around two because it's on a next to a carbonyl group and it has a CH2 next to it. So we expect it to be a triplet as well. And when we do our expansion, I'm going to call this B. We'll do our expansion. We see uh, 
a triplet down here, pass two. This is B. Okay. So now we have two triplets and a big multiplet here left. So let's take a look at our molecule. We expect both of these to be triplets. Okay, the CH3 groups at the end. Uh, oops, I, wanna, I thought I had my laser pointer. We expect both of these to be triplets. We're going to just leave those for a second because this is the one that we can now clearly define. We're going to expect this one. It's splitting with these protons. There's two of them and it's splitting with these protons. There's three of them. So this is either going to be a complicated multiplet or if these are close enough in their coupling constants, there's five of them. We expect um, a peak with six. And if we look at this, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We do have a sextet. Now, it doesn't want to let me return. There we go. So I'm going to call this one C. Doesn't matter that I'm all over the place alphabetically. Uh, I can clearly call this one C. OK, so I've taken care of. Oh, this should be B. Is that correct? Yes. Expect that to be a triplet. That's a triplet. OK, uh, and now. A, B. Oops, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. This is the one C and C. There we go. So all we have left are I'm going to put D here. And E here, where do we expect these to appear? We only have two left. Worst case scenario, take a guess. You have a 50-50 chance of getting it correct because there's only two. The other three are clearly easy. Now we just need to use a little bit of logic here. So we probably expect this one to be further down here because it's closer to the very electronegative oxygen. Uh, I'm sorry, this one, E. So this is E. And this is D. And the reason we can assign these fairly confidently is this one is very far away from anything electronegative, and this one is closer to some of the electronegative groups. So we expect this one to be further down here, and we expect this one to be further down here. So we expect uh, this one to be to the left of this one, and we expect this one to be to the right of this one. So we can confidently make that assignment. Carboxylic acids, if you can get very, very dry samples, uh, you can sometimes see the proton that is on the oxygen and it'll come way out here at 12, okay? Oftentimes you won't see it because it's a very exchangeable proton and it's just hopping on and off and we just don't see it. But if we get our conditions right, dry solvent, uh, we can see it, it'll be way down here. In this case, these hydrogens, if this was just normal acetic acid, it would probably be just past two, but because we have the chlorine there, these come out here at 4.1. These are not any kind of multiplets or anything. This is just uh, a poor spectrum. Amides are interesting. So, Amides are similar to amines in that these are exchangeable protons, so we often see very broad absorptions and they may not integrate fully. Uh, we may have uh, the integrations can be off and that's because they're very exchangeable. But the amide protons appear way down here past about six and the amine protons can be anywhere from one. They can actually move around a bit too, uh, so we're not too, too surprised. In this particular molecule, we can see there's our two CH2 groups, they would be triplets, so we can assign everything. Uh, this looks a little bit messy. Now over here, uh, we have a primary, we just have one NH stretch, and it again, it comes out here, you see it right there. It's low, it's very broad, 
it's not unusual uh, to see that in each absorption to be broad uh, because it's exchangeable. Now we have our ethyl group and we can see that we have a triplet and a quartet. So the only one left to look at is this one and it appears as a doublet. And that's because uh, uh, under these conditions, it is coupling with this proton. So the CH3s there do form a doublet. You may or may not see that coupling. So don't be too surprised if you don't see it. Finally, I wanna talk about uh, primary amides. They're very interesting. I'm gonna talk about primary amides and tertiary amides, but we're, what I wanna talk about is the rotation about that N carbon bond, okay? So amides have a restricted rotation, uh, and because of that, there's a lot of this uh, double bond character, and they don't rotate well. Thus, this hydrogen and this hydrogen can come at different places, and we see that right here. We see two peaks for our amide hydrogens, that is the hydrogens on the nitrogen, because they're slightly different, because of the restricted rotation there. Now we can figure out the rest of this right there, uh, but the important thing here is that we see two absorptions for those protons. As it turns out, that need not be the case. We're doing a slightly different experiment here. We have methyl groups here, so we're seeing singlets for these, and at low temperatures, we see two singlets, slightly different. As we warm up, we get to the point where there starts to be free rotation about this bond, it starts to rotate above that bond. And when it does, the signals merge because they are no longer uh, different because at any one time they're circling about and we see this singlet. So this is good evidence for the fact that there's restricted rotation about that carbon nitrogen bond. And look at this, look at how high temperature we have to get up. We start seeing it coalesce at about 80 degrees, okay? So even at 60 degrees, we very clearly uh, see that there's restricted rotation. So that's a pretty strong bond. And that's all we're gonna talk about uh, for the structure determination of uh, carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid derivatives. I will put this into the module on structure determination uh, as well. Thanks everybody, bye-bye.